I've often spoken on this channel about deployment pipelines. They are a central concept in the practice of continuous delivery. But what do they really look like for a complex system? How do you use one as a tool in your daily work? Let's take a look at a real world example from a real company doing real work. Let's look at a deployment pipeline in action. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the video today, hit like as well. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Harness, Equal Experts, Octopus and Specflow. They're helping us to build our channel, so please support them in turn by checking out their links in the description below. If you'd like to learn more about how to build deployment pipelines, Check out my book, Continuous Delivery Pipelines, available in paperback on Amazon and as an ebook on LeanPub. In this episode, I will show you a real world example of a deployment pipeline. This pipeline is in current active daily use in a successful, fast growing fintech startup based in London. Let me introduce you to Transfic. I'd like to begin by saying a big thank you to Transfic for sharing their deployment pipeline with us. Transfic solves an interesting problem. Imagine that we have a couple of people who'd like to trade. We need to establish a channel of communication between them to allow for this trading. If somebody else wants to join in, it complicates the picture quite quickly. If we had a fourth person, the picture gets even more complex. Clearly, what I'm talking about here is integration, strategies and costs. In this example, we have one person or more likely organization trading with three others. To make this work, we need to establish three separate communication channels, each one distinct, each dealing with the organization and technical differences between the traders. This is bad enough for three channels, but it quickly gets out of hand as we add more. This is a very common problem for big trading institutions. This is the problem that Transfix solve. They act as a translator, a router, a broker, delivering a very fast, highly efficient translation service. That means that a trading organization only needs to implement a single integration to Transfix. Transfix then take on the burden of all of the integrations with other trading partners. This is a kind of device driver for trading, really. Transfic were built on the principles of continuous delivery from the beginning. They're very strong on engineering. They use the tools of continuous delivery to move at high pace with great quality in a difficult problem domain. They build their software in Java with Gradle. They use Jenkins for continuous integration and Ansible for configuration management. They've created their own custom deployment tools, which run on top of SSH. This provides the transport mechanism to shift the bytes around and provides the authorization mechanism to secure the, the, the transfer of information. Security is an extremely important concern for them in this highly regulated industry. Most of the detail, though, doesn't matter too much. You don't need to pick any of these technologies to make continuous delivery or deployment pipelines work. I only include it here to paint the picture of Transfic. This is an effective, complex, high quality, real world system using regular technology. How they work though is what really differentiates them. Here is the visible representation of the Transfic pipeline. This is what they call big feedback. It's a pretty basic UI. Simple HTML and CSS, not much more than that. Nothing fancy at all. Green boxes mean that everything is passing as far as this stage is concerned and that the software is releasable as far as this stage is concerned. Red boxes means that something has failed and the software is not releasable. Grey boxes are test stages that are currently disabled for some reason. Uh, a new stage being created or maybe an old one being retired. Underneath all of this, it's a bit more complicated as you can probably imagine. There are thousands of test cases in all. Lots of automated test environments. There's a lot of stuff going on here. 
Here is the commit stage. It shows some really basic information. The current change that's being processed the, through commit messages, um, who made that change? Uh, and the last time that the commit was run, in this case, eight minutes ago. Remember, this is a shared team resource, and so this, all of this information is useful to the team to keep everybody informed. The most important information here, though, is even simpler than all of that. It's showing that this build is green, it's passing, the software is safe to release as far as this stage knows. All of the tests up to this moment are passing. The last piece of information here is the progress bar and this keeps the picture a bit more dynamic. Uh, it allows team members to see the progress that progress is being made and if anyone is waiting for some particular change to come through the pipeline it kind of gives them an indication of how long they're likely to have to wait. It's all pretty obvious stuff, really. An important point here, though, is that for effective feedback, I think it's really important, best of all, to keep the message clear and simple. This does precisely that. In the next stage, Transfic uh, run a suite of integration tests for some things. These tests are focused on testing things that are a bit too slow to add to the commit stage, but that catch common errors, and so we'd like to see them fail faster uh, than, we, than waiting for a whole acceptance test run. This is a tactical addition to the pipeline, and one that I've seen several teams make uh, at various times. In general, I would advise that if you take this step and use integration tests, run them in parallel with acceptance tests. Still treat the commit stage as a gate, start, the, start both of the integration tests and the acceptance tests running, and then you just get fa early failure through the integration tests. Next is the acceptance stage. Here, they run a wide collection of trading scenario tests to evaluate the system as a whole. Again, the reporting is simple and functional. I much prefer this kind of display, ideally permanently on display in a room where the development teams work. That's in the olden days when teams used to work together in the same room. This is a much stronger signal to send if something goes wrong. It's all too easy to ignore an individual email or a note Slack notification that tells me that I've broken the build. But a big red block on a shared display that everybody can see that lights up as soon as the mistake is made is, gives me a much clearer indication that something needs to happen. We need to start acting to fix this problem. The rest of the stages here are largely focused on three different broad gr groups of tests and evaluations. There are multiple performance tests. Tran the Transfix system is very high performance and so they take performance testing very seriously. There are common stable libraries. Uh, uh, these change at a much slower rate than other parts of the system and so they're treated as kind of external dependencies really. They don't need to be uh, evaluated with every commit to the, the main line of the system. These are effectively independent deployment pipelines for these libraries. Uh, if one is changed, then a copy of the binary output of that stage, the library itself, is recommitted into the main pipeline and re-evaluated, uh, integrated with the rest of the system on its route to production. This is rather the same kind of approach that we that we that we take for a third party library or something like that. The final group of acceptance cycle tests is a function of Transfix business model really. Transfix have a large collection of translators to uh, external trading venues, adapters to integrate with them. These are tested independently of one another and in parallel with one another. So let's take a look at the Transfic pipeline in operation. Here we have Judd starting work on a new feature. I'm pleased to see that he begins by writing a test. Notice how easy the test is to write and how uncomplicated and focused it looks alongside all of the other tests for this component. Now he runs his test. I'm also very pleased to see that Judd is practicing true test-driven development here. 
Next, he writes some code to make the test pass and checks that it works. Now he builds, tests and deploys the system locally so that he can work on an acceptance test. By default, I recommend that you start with an acceptance test uh, and write it first. Uh, but this is a simple change and, to be honest, it's Judd's story, not mine. Transfix build has a target that, that will build, test, package and deploy the system. It's called DRS. For reference, this is a complex distributed high performance system. And here, Judd is deploying it and running it on his laptop. The deployment flexibility that these tools bring and the continuous delivery approach brings is a significant benefit. Using the same mechanisms that will deploy into production, Judd deploys the application and then he writes, he writes his test and runs it and gets a pass. Now he's ready to commit. Let's just pause there for a moment. Okay, it's a simple change, but it's fully tested, both at the unit test level and at the acceptance test level. Assuming that all of these tests pass, there will be no more work to do to release this change into production. I have fast forwarded a bit to tell this story in a reasonable amount of time. But I will tell you that the full length video from the moment when Judd looks at the requirement until he commits the change takes 11 minutes to get to this stage. Judd commits the change and then waits for the commit stage to finish. Again, I sped the video up a bit. The transfit commit stage took seven minutes to complete in this case. I've seen it complete a little bit more quickly than this. Uh, so I guess seven minutes, they're probably about due for a, an optimization pass to see if they can speed it up and get it back under five again. Uh, but even so, for a system of this size and complexity, seven minutes is not at all bad. Judd can move on to something new now. His work's complete. He's satisfied that he's, he's, he's got the test coverage that he needs, the deployment pipeline is whirring away, uh, and uh, it will tell him if there's a problem. It will reject any change that is not deemed releasable. If everything stays green, as it usually is, the software will be releasable. That's all great. That's really nice and straightforward, and I hope that you will see what a fantastic tool it is. But what does it look like when something does go wrong? Here, Michael is making a change. He runs some tests locally to ensure that he's ready to commit. Notice for a moment, in his IDE, he ran nearly 500 tests in about 15 seconds. Another significant benefit of test-driven development is that the tests that we create from it are really fast and efficient. Michael commits his change. Notice too that Transfic are working nearly all of the time on Origin Master. They practice trunk-based development and so true continuous integration. The commit triggers the build and the pipeline starts evaluating it. This time something's gone wrong though. The change has been rejected by the commit stage. Michael's been monitoring his commit just in case this exact circumstance happens. So he's ready, he's ready to deal with the failure and immediately starts trying to see what went wrong. The simple big feedback interface allows him to click through to a more detailed error report. In this case, to check the underlying Jenkins CI system. Several tests has failed as it turns out, eight in all. Michael doesn't want to infect teammates with his problem and Transfic have implemented an embargo system in their deployment pipeline uh, so that they can inform uh, other teammates when there is a problem. This temporarily blocks access while big changes happen. Michael decides in this case to use it, to be honest, probably only for the purposes of this demonstration. Uh, but he's going to use it while he fixes the problem. Remember, continuous integration is a publication process and the pipeline is a shared resource, so keeping everyone in the picture can be a very big help. 
Also though, the embargo is quite a big deal. It's quite a blunt force kind of tool. So you're blocking everybody's route to production by embargoing your pipeline. So if you do implement it, if you do implement one of these things, do use it with some care. Back to our story. Michael starts up the system on his laptop and runs a few acceptance tests that he, thought he thinks might be affected by his change. He chooses the tests that he think are most likely to help him locate the problem. And he finds a failing test amongst that set. There are some interesting subtleties here that I'll bring to your attention. The problem was highlighted by a failing commit test. Great, that's fast feedback. We're going to get an answer in a matter in a handful of minutes. Perfect. This is what we want to happen. If it hadn't failed though, if that test hadn't been there for some reason, if we'd accidentally forgotten to test that case, an acceptance test would have failed and found the problem. So it kind of acts as a backstop. Much, much later than the commit test, probably. This suggests that Transfix pipeline is really quite nicely optimised and working well. The commit stage is catching most errors, which is what we want to happen. The acceptance stage is acting more as a backstop and a confidence builder. We much prefer not to find defects in the much more expensive acceptance stage. We'd like to catch them earlier in the commit stage, and we're going to try and optimise to ensure that that can happen as, as often as possible. In this case, Michael's, Michael's uh, was helped out by these tools and it gave him the information that he needed. The failing acceptance test has given Michael an extra clue. Now he understands what went wrong. So he fixes the problem. He then runs the test again, locally on his laptop, including the, the acceptance test that failed, and everything passes. He commits the change and the pipeline passes it. This is an excellent example of what a fantastic resource an effective deployment pipeline can be. I'd like to once again thank Transfic for their generosity and openness in sharing these examples and so clearly demonstrating what good engineering can look like. The deployment pipeline is an efficient, effective tool. And when you organise your work around it, as demonstrated by Transfic, it can have a valuable impact, not just on building and testing your code, but on your whole development process. Thank you very much for watching.